Hi everyone, this is Melanie and Laura with A Creatively Crafted Life, our weekly showcase of all things creative and crafty. To get us started, Melanie is going to take us through her version of a lake house card. So for today's card, we're actually going to do a card with more of a masculine bend to it. So it'd be great for people in your life, like your dad, your brother. And um, we're going to use a Art Impressions stamp set. And what I'm doing here to start off with is I'm just going to map out where I think the images should go. And it's just going to give me a, an idea or a feel with how I want to align this on the card. Um, I like doing this when I've got a little bit more of a complicated layout so that I don't waste time when I'm actually creating the card itself. I am using the Misty tool, which is another reason why laying it out is really great because I can leave the stamps on the Misty while I'm mapping this out so that when I'm ready to go to the actual card, everything will be aligned exactly the way that I want it to be. Now, this particular stamp set is a trifold stamp set from Art Impressions, and it's actually designed to work with a card that has um, two folds in it so that it, in other words, a trifold, um, so that when you open it, it's got different levels. And I'm actually just doing a twist on it so that everything is on one single surface of the front of the card. Hope that makes sense. Um, so now I've mapped out exactly where I think everything should go. And I've got about four pieces of card stock, stock roughly the size of a card front, so about four and a quarter by five and a half. And I'm using that to stamp the different images on here. Now, it is watercolor cardstock, so it does have a bit of a texture to it. So that's another reason why Misty is really great. You can re-stamp the images over top of each other easily and cleanly and get a good impression. So you'll see that I double stamp almost all of the images. I'm also using a little bit of scrap paper there just to cover up or mask part of the cardstock so that I don't get the other image on there. And as I go through, I'm removing the images. So basically at the end of it, what I've got is three cardstock panels with three different images. So those are the three images there. There's, I think there's a cottage in the background and then there's the second layer will be the, the boats and then the very front layer will be a tree with a deer in front of it. The ink that I used was Hero Arts. So it is a waterproof ink, which is important when you are gonna be doing some watercoloring. Now you'll notice I used a Sharpie here, which is also waterproof. And all I'm doing is just completing the horizon line so that the card looks seamless across the front. Okay, and we are a little bit zoomed out, so I'm not sure if you can see all the details that clearly, but all I am doing is just extending the horizon line on each of the panels so that they complete the width of the card. And you'll see there's three. So the left one is the boats, the middle one is the deer, and then the top one is the, um, is the cottage. And I'm taking some water and I'm using some Distress inks. Laura, have you had any opportunities to use Distress inks like watercolor? I haven't, and it was funny because when I was doing the editing on the video, um, I saw that you, you did that, and I thought, oh, wow, I haven't actually really thought about that. And I know Tim Holtz always says you can use them for watercoloring, um, but it's one of those things where you get locked into one way of using a product and I didn't really think about using it this way as well. So I thought that was really an interesting use. So if you don't have watercolors, if you're just starting out like I am and all you have are distress inks, this is a really good way to be able to do some watercoloring is to use the distress inks. Absolutely. Um, we're also later on in the card, I'm going to use some distress markers and I'm, I'm using both as different mediums within the same card. Um, I don't know if you noticed, but I did lay some water down first. And that's basically just so that when I add the ink to it, it doesn't form any harsh lines. So that's called the wet on wet technique when you do watercolor. And it just gives you that nice soft edge, which is um, what I quite enjoy about watercolor. Now, it is important that you extend the color all the way down far enough so that when we layer all the images on top of each other, um, it looks like one seamless, seamless area. And I didn't know that either uh, about the uh, wet on wet. So see, I learned something new. <laughs> 
Yeah, it's definitely, I don't know if you've ever applied um, color, any kind of color directly to dry paper. Dry paper likes to suck up the moisture and it's quite often where you'll see um, those harsh lines. And sometimes you want that, that may be an image or the view that you're look, or the look that you're going for. Um, but in this case, I wanted just to have a soft kind of diffused look. Right. And it, it makes sense. I mean, it's, it's a way to spread out the color a little bit more, make it a little bit lighter. So it, it definitely makes sense. I just never really thought about it. Yeah. Um, so here's where I'm actually bringing in one of the distress markers, actually a couple of them in different greens. And I like to use distress markers when I'm coloring a smaller surface. Okay. Um, and the reason why is it lets me get into those little nook, nooks and crannies a little bit easier. So if you're concerned about being precise, um, this helps with that. The other reason why I don't like to use distress markers for larger surfaces is that I find they're harder to blend out. And so you will get harsher lines with distress markers than you will by using um, the distress ink pads on the, um, on the uh, no stick mat like I did earlier for the water and the grass. So we're just going to go back we're going to do all the green. Now you'll notice I switch back and forth quite often and that's because water attracts water. So if you add water to a particular area and the area right next to it is wet, it likes to bleed into each other. And so unless that's something you're going for, quite often the best thing to do is color a certain area and let it dry and move on to a different part of your image or your card um, that is dry so that you don't have that mixing going on. So you'll also notice that I use paper towels. Great tool when you're watercoloring. If you ever feel like you've got too much water on your surface, you can just use the paper towel to, to mop up some of that excess, um, excess water. And um, you can use it to lift color too, right? You absolutely can, yeah. If you think it's too dark while it's still wet, it's very easy to, to lift some of that color up. And as a beginner, believe me, that comes in handy a lot. <laughs> And even as with someone that's a little bit more experienced, it's it's still a great thing to to keep in mind as you're as you're doing things. Um, red, <laughs> red is a very staining in, uh, staining color, whether it's in watercolors or using ink. So be very careful with how you use it. It also likes to bleed all over the place. <laughs> so that's just something to keep in mind. Um, when I'm using the markers, I like to draw in where I think the darkest areas would be because like I said, it doesn't quite dissolve as well as, as the ink straight from the uh, no stick mat works. Okay. And we're just going in and just filling in some different colors. For the deer, I'm actually combining a, a few different colors together, some brown and, and, and rusty hinge, just to kind of do the blending right on the image as opposed to blending it, say, like on a palette. And that works pretty well. It gives it some, some variety and, um, and some interest. And you'll notice that I stick to the same colors. I try not to introduce too many different colors within the image, and that's just to make it look more cohesive. You know, I don't need five different reds. I can use the same red throughout the card. So that's something else to keep in mind. It just aesthetically looks a little bit more appealing. The other thing to keep in mind when you're watercoloring is you can always go back. So once it's dry, if you feel that something isn't dark enough, you can always add another layer. And that's um, also what gives a watercolor image quite a bit of interest. Okay. And you're quite the speedy colorer, but it didn't actually... <laughs> It didn't uh, go as quickly as it appears to, did it? No, it d did take quite a while, <laughs> especially because you're um, waiting to let things dry in between. So, um, you know, and there's quite a bit of quite a bit of images or quite a bit of surface to co to color. <laughs> so yeah, it 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 is a little deceiving. It did not take me. 30 minutes to create this card. <laughs> it was quite a bit longer, but I do find it quite therapeutic. Um, and it's different than coloring with say like an alcohol marker. It's a little bit more forgiving, I think. Um, it allows you to be a little bit looser. You don't have to be so in the lines. And actually with watercolor, they do recommend you even leave white spots um, to not paint everything in 100% oh, really? perfect. Yeah, it just makes it more interesting than if it's completely colored in. It makes it look more like an art piece of art as opposed to a coloring book or you know that kind of thing plus 
naturally you get highlights and images and that's what the white is is your highlight your reflective reflective surface right and it's interesting because so you're doing the watercoloring on here and i've seen that a lot on a lot of the um folks that i follow on instagram and a lot of the youtubers that i watch um with card making is so many are doing watercolors and i'd never really thought about that as a medium for making cards or really paper crafting in general i mean i know obviously it's it's an art but i hadn't really connected the two so it's always interesting to me when i see what what everyone can create this way yeah, and what's really great is with the paper crafting industry in general is you see a lot of crossovers from different industries. Like I've seen people doing like embroidery and stitching on paper, which is which is really cool, right? You know, um, why not? If it's something that you can do elsewhere, why not try it with your with your paper crafting projects, whether it's a card or scrapbooking or even just a home decor piece. Right, easy. and I think that's part of what's been appealing for me is being able to see that there are so many different mediums that you can combine, you know, the whole mixed media um, trend that's going on right now. It really is, um, it's, it's nice because it's not just one flat medium, right? There's so many different, aspects to it so it's exciting isn't it yeah that you right. can that you can do different things and that there there is no limitations placed on you you'll see here i'm going back over the image just to darken up like i mentioned earlier and um just very carefully going over top of it and blotting if it gets to be a little bit too dark now you also notice at some point i decided that i probably should be painting outside of the lines <laughs> and that's because we're actually going to trim these out using a pair of scissors and um, and sometimes it's it's advantageous to have a white border but in this case I want it to look like a scene when we're all said and done and so I don't want to see any white where there shouldn't be white and so if you actually paint outside of the border um, it gives you a little bit of room to trim and not have to worry that it's going to look like you hand cut it out so I did do a little bit of that. Um, you'll, I don't know if you'll see if we edited that out or not, but when I do trim, if you find or feel that you didn't extend it far enough, go back and just you know add a little bit more color to it just so that it's not so glaringly obvious. I did notice um, when I was viewing it that you, and I, I can't remember if we left this in there or not, but that you um, did kind of color around the edges as well, which I thought was interesting. I mean, I wouldn't think about doing that, but I can see that because then you blend the color out all the way to the edge. And like you said, you don't see all that white space. Yeah. So, so the idea behind the card is we're going to take these three different images and stack them on top of each other using foam tape. And so if this had been painted as a single flat painting, you wouldn't have any white halo around it. So that's what we're trying, what we're trying to avoid is that image. And here is actually where I'm going outside the lines and just extending the green out there a little bit. Um, I mentioned earlier, this was an art impression stamp set. And uh, I really love the company Art Impressions. Um, Lori, you and I both went to a, a trade show or an ex, a scrapbook expo and um, got to buy some of the products directly there. It's quite interesting, the diverse line that she carries, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, you can definitely see the style. Um, the style is very... Like, you can tell that it came from the same person, but there's a lot of diversity in the types of images and also what you can do in the images. There was a lot of the, you know, the pop-up kind of cards, and there's a lot of different um, different formats that, that she has in her, in her stamps. So I really like that a lot. It has some really appealing images yeah the the, uh, the origin or the main artist i believe who does most of the artwork is bonnie krebs and i actually met her at a scrapbooking show probably about five years ago and um up until that point i'd never heard of them and she was demonstrating their um uh, watercolor the art impressions way which is another line of stamps that they that they carry that are actually geared towards doing watercoloring and um I saw her demonstrate it, and I think I must have watched her for about 45 minutes. 
I was just completely fascinated with this approach. And it was, she made it look so, so easy that I'm like, even if you don't have a clue what you're doing, you can definitely um, learn to watercolor, as she calls it, the um, art impressions way. <laughs> so here I am just going through, I'm just taking a pair of scissors and I'm just trimming out the image fairly close to the edge. Um, but again, not right on the line. I'm give, leaving a little bit of a border, which again is why um, I did extend the color outside, outside of the lines. And I'm um, sorry that I went a little bit off, <laughs> off camera there. Um, sometimes when you get caught up in an activity, you, you don't always remember exactly where the camera view ends and uh, so well, and I think you tend to forget that you have the camera on especially with something like this that you do all the time right exactly and then it's close-up work right like you need you want to see exactly what you're doing and so um so you bring you tend to bring it in a little bit closer to yourself so now I've got the the different images cut out and you can see how I'm I'm going to align them on top of each other and I'm pointing out that I missed missed a couple spaces you can see they're very light there and so I'm just gonna go back in with a little bit more blue ink and just kind of extend that down a little bit so that it's not quite so obvious um, if it was the actual shore as opposed to like a, a drop of a bank or something like that it would have been fine but because we're trying to give it an illusion of, of a, a more forward um, forward foreground, um, I just felt it was a little bit better to go in and, and add a little bit more color. So don't think that once you put the colors away that you can't go back, you definitely can. So now I'm just going to take a die and just trim out the um, trim out the panel. Actually, this one here only does a stitch border around it. It doesn't actually cut, which is um, kind of cool. So as long as your card shape or your panel is the size that you want it to be, which is an A2 size, it'll actually put your stitch lines in there, which gives it a little bit of interest. And that noise that <clears throat> your machine makes as you're running the die through is completely normal, it turns out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we've, we've uh, cut that out so you don't have to listen to the crunching, but um, yes, that is, uh, it is a little bit loud and, and does protest a little bit. Um, so for the other two bits of images, I want the same uh, stitch border to extend so that again it looks seamless from the front. So I'm just lining that up. Now I'm using a magnetic platform. So that does help to hold the die in place over top of the image. As you can see, it's not much that I'm that I'm trimming out there. So that platform you're using is actually magnetic? It is. Oh, okay. I was yeah. wondering because I know I have issues with that sometimes yeah. where it moves around and... I just usually tape something down. Yeah, and that's quite a common way. And actually, to be honest, like the magnetic platform is great for larger surfaces, but if you're doing a lot of tiny um, work, I still end up taping. Okay. And the reason why is because it's not a solid magnet. It's like six or eight magnets within the thing. So. Oh, really? So it's not one platform? Because it would make it really heavy, probably, Probably. Right? And Maybe. expensive, I yeah, would think. right. So if you've got small images, sometimes they'll jump on you and that's because they're being drawn towards the magnet so that can be a little bit um if you're, if you're trying to be very particular that can be a little bit mm, counter counterproductive i guess so then i still use a little bit of tape so i just pulled up uh i believe this was a simon says stamp polymer stamp and um i'm just going to pull the happy birthday message from here and i am going to emboss this so what i'm doing is making sure that my panel is dry <laughs> because embossing powder tends to stick everywhere <laughs> even even um, even on a on a dry on a dry panel so it's um, I just wanted to give it a little bit of of assurance that it is that it is indeed dry um, I'm using the misty again again that's not necessary you can use a regular clear block if that's what you have um, but it, it is very nice to be able to position your image where you want it to go and then just have the um, misty um, panel come across and pick up the image. I'm just double checking to make sure that the other images are not going to overlap the message. So we're just doing a quick little check to make sure it's still going to um, appear exactly the way I want. And of course, you're so meticulous. Well, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sometimes. <laughs> and then other times you just got to move on. <laughs> so I'm just um, uh, just gonna give this a, give this a shot here. Now, 
you notice I inserted a piece of foam. And that's because the Art Impressions stamps were on a cling mount, so they already had foam built into the stamps. And so I had to remove that panel so that the image would stamp properly. But now that I've switched over to a polymer stamp, we need the extra height so that it'll, it'll stamp properly. And then you used your little powder bag over the image so that it you won't get the ink everywhere? Yeah, the embossing powder. The embossing powder, yeah. yeah. It helps to remove some of the static from the, um, from the card base so that, um, like you said, we don't get <laughs> embossing powder where we don't want it to be. I'm just using some white embossing powder. I believe this is from Stampin' Up, but Hero Arts, I think, has some. Ranger has some. All of that will work just fine. Um, I do put it in a, in a bigger container than what it comes into because I'm lazy, and it's just easier to dump back into a bigger container than those little tiny pots. And uh, so that's what you see me doing there. You'll also notice that I'm using the Ranger Heat tool for the embossing, and um, you can definitely use the tool. It does heat up hot enough to melt the embossing powder. So even though it looks like a hair dryer, it is much, much harder, hotter than a, than a hair dryer, and so will emboss. Now, it's not the ideal tool for embossing, and if you have a heat gun that has a more concentrated um, opening on it, those ones will actually emboss quicker. And, and that's important if you're worried about warping on your cardstock and stuff. But in a pinch, you can use this one, and I just was too lazy to grab my other tool out. Um, it does work, and the paper's already a little bit warped anyways because I added water to it. So <laughs> at this point, what's a, little, what's a little bit more, and we're gonna straighten it out with a lot of foam tape. So I noticed that you re-inked the image. Was it because you hadn't, were there portions that you had missed with the exactly. ink Exactly. Yeah, and that's another benefit of using the Misty. Right, because it's already lined up. It's already lined up. So I just use a piece of scrap paper to cover most of the image because I didn't want to double emboss it. I just wanted to, to uh, pick up the little bit that I missed. And so that's what you see me here is I just re-stamped it just at the end. I'm, the Y didn't come through completely clear. And that's, that's a part of a problem when you're stamping with clear embossing ink. You don't always see that. So you see me wiggling the paper back and forth, and that's because it's warped a little bit. <laughs> so I'm just trying to straighten it out a little bit. If you're really worried about how warped your cardstock is, um, you can always sandwich it between some books and let it sit overnight, and that will help um, level it out quite a bit. And I'm just taking some, uh, I think this is not quite navy cardstock from Stampin' Up. Again, any type of navy cardstock would work, or you could even use green if you wanted to. I just thought the blue was a nice backdrop to cor correspond with the water of the lake or river or pond or whatever you want to call it. And so I'm just gluing that down. Now, the, there is no edge on this one. So the front panel is four and a quarter by five and a half, so you don't see any blue outline. And I'm taking some 3M foam tape and uh, just using that on the back of the panel or the, the images with the boats and just adhering that to the back, just a single, just a single level. And this 3M foam tape is great. It's pretty inexpensive. Um, you do get a huge roll though. <laughs> yeah, I bought one and I was like, wow, this thing is really big. <laughs> but it does go a long way, so that's nice. You don't have to keep buying the small rolls because I have seen the small ones in the store. But. Exactly. And it's great when you've got large areas to raise up as opposed to using like a pop dot or a, right. or a foam dimensional or something like yeah, that. Yeah, where you'd have to use, you know, 20 you know, of them. Takes you 20 minutes to peel all the backings <laughs> off, you know. The only thing I have noticed with the 3M tape is that it's not super sticky. Right. So I didn't do it on this card, but I would, if I was going to do it again, what I would probably do is once I peel the backing tape off, I'd probably just add some um, liquid adhesive to it just to give it a little bit of extra stick. Because again, remember our card panel is a little bit warped, which means now adhesion is going to be a little bit tougher tougher to get but it's really easy you can actually tear the, fo the foam tape off the roll or trim it down to smaller pieces and the backing comes off really easy normally <laughs> um, yeah it it really does and it gives it a nice dimension once you actually lay it down it it gives that nice dimension to it yeah and for this one here um, 
at, I'm only putting foam tape on the bottom. I'm not putting it at the top of the tree. So I'm only putting a single layer on this because it's gonna rest on top of the one that below that already has a single layer. So the bottom is actually two layers thick, all said and done. So that wraps up the card for today. Hope you enjoyed it. All the supplies will be in the description below or on our website at a creativelycraftedlife.com. Thank you so much for joining us and please leave any comments below so that we can find out what you thought of our very first video. Thanks everyone, happy crafting.